It is uh, yeah. 305. I'm going to call the meeting to water. And I'm going to turn the meeting over right away to uh, Tom Howe. He's with the Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forests. And he's been kind enough to come up and to give us a sneak preview of what conservation easements are all about and how we might be able to use them on the county land. And before we begin, why don't, I think Tom has introduced himself to everybody, but why don't we just go around again and introduce ourselves, so starting with you, Ken. Uh, my name is Ken Robichaud. I'm the county administrator. Gail Drew, just on the committee. Okay. Uh, Mark McConaughey, uh, county delegation chairman. Okay. Steve Knox. Susan Goddard. Amanda B. Uh, county commission chair. Okay. Great. Tom, the floor is yours. Thank Tell you. Tell us all about conservation easements. Well, great. Thank you for um, including me on your agenda. This is happy following, as you know, a, an initial conversation that I had with Steve. Um, and I'm here not only wearing my own hat with the Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forests, where I work, but also somewhat on behalf of a loose-knit coalition of, of conservation groups that have been um, working informally together over a number of years to try to promote um, more conservation of lands initially within the Ossipee Mountain Range but more broadly within kind of the larger area and that coalition includes the Lakes Region Conservation Trust, the Green Mountain Conservation Group, um, the Dan Hole Pond Watershed Trust and perhaps some of the Nature Conservancy and maybe some others I'm not even remembering. But, um, so I'm here kind of on behalf of, of that All group of as above. well. Um, so, uh, having said that, um, my job at the Forest Society is as a uh, so-called land agent where I work directly with landowners to set up permanent conservation arrangements for property. And typically that involves our acquisition of land or the development rights on land. And those development rights take the legal form of what is called a conservation easement. And we've been doing this work uh, for quite a long time, since 1901. Um, I've only been with it for 21 years. And um, we hold now something like 180 actual ownerships, reservations around the state, something like 54,000 acres that we uh, manage for a variety of um, uh, uses, uh, forest how, management. How many acres was that again? Something like 54,000. Okay. okay. Um, for public recreational use, forestry, wildlife, agriculture in some cases, and so on. And then we hold something on the order of 800 uh, conservation easements around the state totaling about 120,000 acres and we have major continuing oversight responsibilities for keeping an eye on those conservation easement lands to make sure that the uses happening on those properties remain consistent with the initial restrictions that are set up and embodied in the conservation easements. So that's a very quick overview of um, my organization's uh, activities and role relative to land conservation and the context for my being here. Um, I have handed out here an agenda, which is the first page. What follows is basically all of sort of the key talking points that I wanted to share with you in hopes that uh, you don't have to feel enslaved to your pen or pencil as we go along here and I've tried to sort of put down the key stuff so you have something to take away that can reinforce um, the time that we have together here for the next 50 minutes. Um, so it's there as a resource uh, for you to do as you wish with. I think I wanted to, um, what I really want to do is spend a little time giving you uh, a good understanding of what conservation easements are and how they work. Um, and that will really be the bulk of what I want to talk about with you. Um, I'll touch briefly on two other counties that have um, put conservation easements on their lands and touch briefly on some 
information resources that you might find helpful as you think about the possibility of a conservation easement on county lands here. Um, the, the key things that I hope you'll take away from our time are um, three or four messages here. First of all, the basic concept that a conservation easement is a permanent set of restrictions on the use of the land. That's the core concept of what a conservation easement um, really is at its core. Um, secondly, hope you'll remember that there's, there's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all conservation easement. They have flexibility to some degree and reflecting either the different land involved or the different group that may be holding the conservation easement but the point is, what I may be talking about reflecting the Forest Society's general approach isn't necessarily exactly how some other land trust or conservation group might approach a conservation easement on property here or anywhere else for that matter. So there's one model, there's no one model that fits everything then that is. Correct. Okay. Having said that, you'll also find a fair amount of consistency yep. across the board as well. Well, again, we'll talk more about that. Okay, can I just interrupt you for one second? When you scribble to the county forester, say, Wendy, please jump in any time on this. Okay, sure. Thank you. Would you want to join us at the table? <laughs> okay. A third sort of take home here is the notion that your potential sale of a conservation easement on the county property might, might be a useful tool for you to give serious thought to because it may be able to generate uh, additional income for the property and for you. It may be able to protect, of course, the key features of the land uh, that seem to matter from a conservation standpoint. And it also may enhance your ability to do other things on the land uh, that are consistent with your vision and future uh, uses for the property. Again, we'll talk more about that. Okay, good, because I'm curious as to how that might generate more income. Yep. Um, and then finally, sort of the final takeaway is that, um, and I've touched on this already, is that it's important for you to find a conservation group as you embark on this process that seems to be a, a right fit for what you're about, what the land is about, and the kinds of things that you might envision using uh, and doing on the property. Um, so those are sort of the key themes that I hope will um, continue to sort of touch on as we go through here. And I'll, I'll happily take questions along the way but I'll also say that um, I'll, there's a very good chance that your question might be covered in the things I plan to um, go over. So uh, if we can sort of balance those interests, I, I want to be sure I get done within the time frame that you've allotted. So um, uh, we'll, we'll chug along and, and see where we get to. If I could just, I, I yep. apologize for interrupting again. The meeting's going to last till five. Okay. And while even I had talked about an hour, if we're running over a little bit, don't worry about that. And okay. The information we get in is more important than we run over the moment. Thank you. I'll kind of look to you for guidance okay. on going beyond four. Um, so, in terms of an overview of where we of of what a conservation easement, the, the the sort of sound bite that I use in terms of conveying the concept of what this thing is. It's a written promise by a landowner that that land is not going to be developed further into the future. And uh, it's, it's um, a binding set of legally uh, enforceable restrictions on the use of the land. And the organization or entity that agrees to acquire and hold the conservation easement, what I'll refer to as the easement holder, or holder for short, um, can be either a private land trust type of organization, which the Forest Society is an example of, or the Lakes Region Conservation Trust, or the Dan Hole Pond Watershed Trust, Nature Conservancy. These are all private, non-profit, charitable 
organizations, land trusts, generic term, or it can be held by a governmental entity that has an explicit conservation purpose and focus to it. That could be as local as something like the Ossipi Conservation Commission, and it could be the state of New Hampshire, it could be the federal government. Um, all of those entities, uh, I can't speak to Ossipi, but uh, the, certainly the state and the federal government do have programs by which they acquire and hold conservation easements on land. So, you counties. Can, uh, county could be as well. Um, we can talk more about the requirements that a holder has to demonstrate, but one of them is that there has to be an explicit and demonstrable conservation uh, capacity within a legitimate holder of a conservation easement. Um, it can't be just any old, not the right phrase, it can't be any governmental entity. There needs to be some qualifiers on that. Um, Property that you own, either right, um, okay. right. It, the the county could not hold a conservation easement on the land it owns itself. That's the fox guarding the hen house, uh, <laughs> if you will. There's a conflict, inherent conflict of interest in an arrangement like that. It would uh, need to be some other entity. Um, the as I mentioned, the conservation easement takes the form of a legal document, typically called a conservation easement deed, that is recorded at the Registry of Deeds, uh, just downstairs. And um, it becomes a permanent part of the so-called title or records associated with that land. The easement, the conservation easement, runs with the land. It doesn't care who or what actually owns the land. There's no constraint on the uh, ability of the landowner who signs the conservation easement, there's no constraint on that uh, landowner choosing to convey that restricted property to any other person or entity at any time and under any circumstances of price. You know, give it away, sell it, whatever. It's just that the future owners of that land still need to be abiding by the terms of the restrictions that are spelled out in detail in the conservation easement deed. So the easement is blind to the actual specific landowner uh, who happens to be the one or the entity that sets up these permanent restrictions. Let me talk a little bit about what those typical restrictions might look like. And again, most of what I'm describing are terms that you would tend to see in most other group easements, uh, but these reflect specifically the Forest Society's uh, starting document, if you will. When we draft a conservation easement, we're working from a template document that reflects our current best language and, and um, understanding of how easements can work best. And um, very commonly, um, you will see at the outset a provision that says basically no commercial or industrial uses of that land except for forestry and agriculture, two very common exceptions. Um, and those are obviously important exceptions because, in fact, that's, as I understand it, a great deal of what use you're making of your lands at present and may well uh, continue to use your lands for those purposes. As long as it's followed by the best management practices. That's right. That's right. And that's exactly feeding into my next point. That what was best management? Well, that's articulated in the conservation yeah. easement, but in the case of agriculture, we cite uh, as an example of best practice the uh, Department of Agriculture's actual publication called Best Management Practices yes. for Agriculture. Yeah. Actually, it's the state of New Hampshire publication. Um, in the case of forestry, there uh, we use as a statement of best practice the guide to good forestry in the Granite State um, as a guideline. 
Uh, it's not intended to be an absolute prescription, but to serve as an important set of principles and practices uh, that need to inform what's actually happening on the ground. Some specific, more specific things that we include within our forestry provisions are that there has to be a forest management plan prepared by a licensed forester and provided to the easement holder in advance of actual operations on the ground. And that forest management plan needs to contain a, a number of things that are uh, required to be in that document and reflecting the goals of the forestry activities that are articulated in the conservation easement deed. Um, additionally, the actual operations on the ground forestry-wise need to be supervised by a licensed forester. And the activities on the ground, not surprisingly, need to be reflecting and in accordance with the things laid out in the management plan. All fairly kind of common sense intuitive stuff, but those connections and requirements really matter. What we do not try to do is have the easement terms be overly prescriptive and detailed about exactly you know, how much basal area of the forest you can cut within a certain time period. We've seen easements like that, and in fact, once or twice, we've attempted to do easements along those lines. And we've learned um, from our experience and perspective that those approaches tend not to work very well because these easements are in perpetuity. Forever is a really long time, and as Woody Allen used to say, especially near the end. <laughs> and we, you know, we think we know what the right way to practice forest management is today in terms of things like buffers and distances and uh, details that matter on the ground. But heavens to Betsy, we surely won't have those same understandings and details foremost in our minds 50 years from now. And we can't pretend to know today what's going to be the best way to do things forevermore. So what you'll find in our easement is more a reliance on the principles and the goals behind what's proposed to happen on the property and less reliance on a bunch of really specific statements about exactly how to do something. And that, of course, means then that there's an ongoing marriage of the parties here in any conservation easement. The landowner and the easement holder really rely on an ongoing communication and relationship uh, forevermore in terms of key activities going on on the ground and having a really good dialogue about major things proposed to change or happen on the land is critical to ensuring consistency with the easement terms. Otherwise, there can be a real invitation for disconnects, problems, violations, enforcement action that frankly might be able to be avoided uh, in the way that we're, uh, that we prescribe. So that, I hope, gives you a sense of kind of the approach, at least in terms of forestry and, and agriculture. Another common provision is one that typically would say no subdivision of the property, um, with a couple of notable exceptions. One would be, and yours might be a case in point, where you have a, a large property in relative terms. Um, if you thought it was important to have the ability to subdivide your 800 or so acres or whatever acreage you decide would be appropriate for a conservation easement, presuming it's some hundreds of acres, whatever that number might be. If you were, uh, if you thought it was important to have some flexibility to subdivide the ownership into different parcels so that maybe you had the ability to sell or convey ownership of a certain portion of your property 
to some other person or entity for some other use, not other use, but for uses still consistent with the conservation easement, then we could entertain inclusion of an exception and a provision in the easement that specifically allows for that kind of thing, um, if that were important to you. What we don't want to see happen is subdivision of property uh, resulting in you know two acre little bits and pieces that you carve off they still would have to be subject to the easement terms but frankly we don't want to have to steward uh, and take on the responsibilities of monitoring and enforcing you know two acre easements uh, uh, resulting from what may have initially started as a you know 600 acre conservation easement so we might have some and predictably would have some minimum size requirement uh, if you wanted to have some flexibility for subdivision. Another example uh, that's cited in our easements uh, the allowing for subdivision would be if, for example, um, you wanted to convey part of your property to um, the Dan Hole Pond Watershed Trust because they have subsequently acquired some adjacent property and you think and they think that maybe it would be great if you were to convey ownership of a 100 acre tract onto them because they want to manage it and you're happy to have them manage it and maybe, maybe you perceive they could do a better job of managing it for whatever purpose is appropriate. The point is um, that could also be reason to allow for a subdivision of the land for some um, adjacent ownership by a legitimate conservation entity, whether it's a governmental entity or a, another land trust type, type of group. Um, very typical, you'll see provisions about no structures or improvements on property <coughs> except for, and a, again a common sort of string of qualifiers, except for forestry, agriculture, habitat management, um, other conservation related uses, and also non-commercial outdoor recreational uses. So things like uh, a sugar house, a barn, a shed for storing farming equipment, um, woods roads, farm roads, a farm stand, um, trails, boardwalks, all those kinds of things, hunting blinds, uh, all those kinds of things would be sort of by right sorts of uses that um, are uh, accepted and allowed for generally under the terms of the conservation easement. I'm, I'm, I'm glossing over more specifics that are in the easement. There are some limitations on certain types of structures that appear in the easement, but again, I'm trying to give you just a, a general feel for the overview here, hence I'm not going into as much detail as you would read about in a sample easement. No dredging or filling or alteration of terrain. Basically no pushing of dirt around on the property unless again it's in direct furtherance of one of those typically uh, standard uh, items in the list of forestry, agriculture, and so on. Um, no mining or extraction of sand or gravel. Again, except if you need, for example, if you've got sand and gravel on one part of the property and you might need to build a woods road um, for, for you know, commercial forestry operations on another part of the property, there are some allowances for using those materials on site. What is prohibited is a wholesale you know, commercial sale of sand and gravel resources um, because that is viewed as um, potentially destructive of the conservation resources uh, to be protected by the easement. No disposal of man-made or environmentally hazardous materials, kind of a straightforward uh, provision um, on the property. No conveyances of rights of ways or other partial interests in the property to other parties unless the holder has an opportunity to approve of that right of way or that conveyance. Basically just to make sure that what's proposed to be conveyed 
isn't detrimental to the purposes of an easement. Common example that comes up sometimes is if the owner of the land subject to an easement um, is approached by the neighbor who says, gee, I'd really love to build a house on my property, which is further back in, wouldn't you please give me a right-of-way through your property for a driveway so I can get to my house site and build my home there? Well, that's probably not going to be in the interest of protecting the conservation resources on the encumbered property to add a driveway that goes through the easement land, bringing an added level of intrusion and human usage uh, that is not a conservation-related purpose. And so that would, t that would be an example that we probably would deny. On the other hand, if the abutter comes to the landowner and says, we'd like a right-of-way uh, for the next three months so that we can conduct a forestry operation on our adjacent property, that's a very typical kind of thing that we would permit uh, because the forestry operations are a use that's consistent with the purposes of the conservation easement, even though the forestry activities are on abutting property. So that kind of situation warrants uh, a, a review and look-see in each instance before we would automatically say yay or nay to it. Um, finally, or not finally, um, second to the end, no use of the conservation easement for meeting minimum requirements for developing other property that the landowner may have. That may be a moot point in this instance. Um, you are, as I understand it, exempt from local ordinances. Is that correct? Is yeah. the county? Yes. Is, is this referring to like cluster housing? <clears throat> um, could be, yeah. So it's more a comment that's uh, more a provision applicable to a private ownership residence. Um, if a landowner keeps out five acres, puts in the other 95 acres under easement, and then later the landowner wants to build the Sheraton Hilton on the five acres, but needs to demonstrate to the town that they've got at least 20 acres to do that. What the easement says is you can't count any of the 95 acres under easement towards uh, meeting minimum requirements of frontage or size requirements for developing those five acres. In other words, for development purposes, you've just got five acres for demonstrating whatever it is you want to demonstrate to the town. Again, le perhaps less relevant here given your uh, status as, as a county. Finally, uh, no disturbance of boundary markers. It's really just a restatement of what is state law. There are some exceptions to that but we think it useful to re, uh, remind landowners of that um, because it's both in the interest of the easement holder um, as well as the landowner to, to remember that that's a requirement in place. If that includes stone walls? Um, if the stone wall, I um, you know, I need to look back at the language before I misspeak. Um, it certainly would apply to monuments, you know, such as rebars or markers that have been installed. Um, I think it applies to stone walls as long as those stone walls are considered to be part of the legal boundary. Again, there are some exceptions that are allowed for, uh, uh, to that. But I, I think if it is part of the legal boundary, then it would, it would apply. Um, that I think is state law, Tom. Right. Right, exactly. So those are typical use restrictions. Um, <clears throat> and then you will typically see in a conservation easement a section called reserved rights of the landowner. And these are typically, this is typically the part of the easement that says, okay, here were some restrictions. Now here are some things that otherwise, if we didn't list them under reserved rights, might be prohibited by the string of activity, the string of restrictions that we have just enumerated above under the so-called use limitation section. So reserved rights is where you might want to put some things that wouldn't necessarily be obviously allowed, 
under the use limitations. And one of the, we have two standard things that we at least uh, like to talk about with landowners. One of them is to potentially accommodate renewable energy uh, production facilities with limitations for sure. But um, we increasingly are seeing uh, a lot of landowners wanting to be able to install facilities, especially if their adjacent or excluded area next to the easement land really doesn't have a good site for, say, some solar panels. Um, but there may be a great site for that on the easement property. We don't want the easement itself to completely frustrate that possibility. And again, there's some qualifiers and some limitations, uh, but there's an explicit effort to be accommodating to a degree for that possibility on the easement property. And so we put that in. Um, there's also another provision uh, that we have developed called uh, an allowance for commercial activities with minimal or de minimis uh, impacts. And we, this really has come out of a tremendous amount of conversation that I'm sure you've all read about and perhaps had in various times and places about things such as agritourism, whatever agritourism means. I really don't know what that term means because it's so broad and people use it in a whole host of different ways. What really matters is what's the actual activity that someone is proposing to do on the land. Case in point, um, if someone wants to um, rent out, if a farmer or the county wants to rent out its you know, fabulous fields for weddings, on those idyllic summer weekends when people want to get married in gorgeous places. Um, you know, there have been all sorts of fights about whether that's, is that agritourism and, or is that, should that be part of agriculture? Our easements now take the position, no, no, having a, conducting a wedding on a piece of ground is not inherently an agricultural activity. But, we also don't want the easement to frustrate the possibility of allowing for that kind of activity, again, within limits, within some qualifications, because that activity may be a really important way to generate additional income for the farmer or for the landowner, and if it really doesn't have a significantly negative impact on the conservation features on the property, then we say, why not? You know, why should the easement frustrate that? Because otherwise, we have that provision that we've just talked about that says no commercial activities on the property. And if you're renting out the land for wedding parties, that's a commercial activity. And that's why some of our older easements, we really struggle with this issue and sometimes have to just say, I'm sorry, the easement is very clear in saying no commercial activities. And even though 30 years ago when we drafted easements, we didn't anticipate the kinds of things that are going on now. Um, and so we, we have to live by that language that strictly said no commercial activities period. I mean, except for forestry and agriculture. Um, anyway, our current easement really works to be more accommodating for the creative entrepreneurial kinds of things that lots of landowners are wanting to do on their property. And so we want to be accommodating for those possibilities as long as there's demonstration that fundamentally the conservation features of the land are not being harmed by that proposed activity. Question, Tom. Where, quote, agritourism, and as broad as that is being interpreted, uh, now you may really give some leeway and flexibility to that in, in, in new conservation easements. With someone who had a previous conservation easement where that was not allowed, would that be a negotiable point? We say now we allow it, whereas when we wrote the agreement with you, we didn't, so yes, we're willing to loosen that language in yours, or is that basically just locked in? Regardless of if it's permitted now, 
it couldn't be better in the, in the past. We'll touch on that in just a couple okay. minutes. I'll, okay. I'll circle back I'm to that. Jumping ahead. Yep. No, that's all right. Uh, it's a great question. Um, so those are typically two kind of standard reserved rights. We don't require those to be in place, but we want to be sure we talk through those because many landowners often are interested in having those flexibilities and opportunities. So our job when we hold a conservation easement, when we acquire a conservation easement, we have to monitor the use of that land, at least annually. And the way we do that with the seven or eight hundred of these things that we have all over Kingdom Come, um, we fly over and photograph all of our easement properties annually. And in addition, we are on the ground uh, with our staff typically visiting with the landowner every year to two years, sometimes every three years, depending on the situation um, and the remoteness and the, the degree to which we need to be visiting the frequency of visit. Um, so monitoring is a big part of the obligation we have as the holder of an easement. And then secondly, fundamentally, we have to be prepared to enforce the terms of the conservation easement if push comes to shove and as a last resort, if we need to take some legal action after all other reasonable efforts have failed on our part to reach a resolution about a problem that has come up, then our obligation is to do what's needed to uphold those restrictions um, as best we can. We've had quite a lot of, lot of experience with violations, um, and to date, I can say that our most expensive one has cost <coughs> us something on the order of $140,000. Uh, to say the least, that's serious money, and it's why also we lay in funding for each new easement we take on to provide financial support uh, in the form of a pooled stewardship fund, which we have the ability to draw on for any of our conservation easements if and when we have issues that really require substantial time and effort and, if necessary, court action, legal expense. Um, so these are, these are humbling liabilities and responsibilities that we take on on our side of the equation when we sign on to a conservation easement. We are committing our best effort as an organization to uphold those restrictions and terms forevermore. So it's a big deal for us um, to take on each of these new sets of responsibilities and liabilities. In the course of that relationship that we create, what, as I mentioned, what we want to do is build a a good relationship with the landowner so that we're minimizing the chance of either inadvertent violations or, God forbid, the worst kind of violations that are blatant where the landowner says, you know, I don't care what your restrictions are. I'm going to go do what I want and my, my attorney will take care of that or fix it. We've run into situations like that. To say the least, those tend not to be very positive or good ongoing working relationships based on understanding and trust and so on. So building and maintaining those relationships with landowners is of great importance to us. It's why we have an easement stewardship staff of five or six people, uh, each of whom is assigned uh, a collection, a portfolio of different easements within a certain geography or area. Um, and that's part of the continuity that we want to build over time so that you get to know that land steward or that easement steward and they get to know you and who the right players are and the people so that over time and repeated visits you build up that rapport and easy ability to talk when you need to. If you're wondering about some activity that you're not sure is permitted by the easement or what the requirements are, the best thing to have happen is to have you feel comfortable picking the phone up 
and saying, hey, we're thinking about this, that, or the other thing. We weren't clear about how the easement treats that. What do you think? And there will be a dialogue and maybe a site visit and you know just more engagement to understand better what the proposal is and what how that might work. So that's the kind of constructive relationship that really takes a lot of effort to maintain. And um, historically, have the courts pretty much sided with the easement holder? Is, is there is enough tradition there where the, the courts will say, okay, you know, it's it's yours to lose. <laughs> Yeah, um, it, it's it's emerging and evolving, yeah. but um, easements, the very first easement was set up uh, in New Hampshire, I'm sorry, the first easement in New Hampshire was set up in about, I think it was 1970, um, and there have been a number of court cases in different counties um, establishing very helpful kind of foundational uh, readings and generally supporting uh, and reinforcing of conservation easements. So what has happened to date has been very positive. And you know, these things are here to stay and the courts recognize that and, um, and so far so good. Okay. Yeah. Um, some key principles that really get to all of the easements we hold and set up, will set up in the future, and this is now coming back, Steve, to a question you had about, um, you know, perpetuity and can it be amended or revised and so on. Um, the, these things are permanent, um, but there are at least two exceptions by which easements can be undone. One of them is really obscure and theoretical, and the other is quite practical and um, not that infrequent. Um, the, inf the, not, the, the fairly, I the, the more common of the two, I'll say it that way, is the power of government to condemn property for a public purpose. <coughs> and as you know, any level of government has that power, whether it's the feds, the state, you, the county, have the power of condemnation, eminent domain, uh, even towns do. The most common instance that we've seen of that power being exercised and actually extinguishing easements has to do typically with roads, you know, the widening of a road or the building of a new exit ramp off of a state highway or something to do with roads, straightening out a road um, where there's a wicked turn that uh, the town is committed to doing away with. Um, that can extinguish a conservation easement, or at least the part of the easement that covers the very specific area of land that's in question. And as you know from, um, in the case of en any eminent domain proceeding, the use that is made for uh, the land that's condemned must be a legitimate public purpose. It can't just be for you know, economic development purposes uh, solely. And the holder of the property rights must be compensated for the value of the property interests that have been condemned. So in the case of a conservation easement being on property, you have two, in effect, two property owners. You have the actual owner of the land itself as one uh, party, but then you also have the easement holder whose rights have value in a monetary sense. And so both of those parties would be compensated in the case of a condemnation proceeding. Um, the other much more obscure and really theoretical possibility that is allowed for is uh, changing conditions surrounding the property that caused the conservation significance that existed back when the easement was set up to basically have disappeared. Unlikely example, but I'll, just because it, 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 it at least helps one understand this, if a conservation easement were set up principally to protect some animal or plant species and habitat, <laughs> that's located just on this one property and it's really rare and really special, whatever that might be. And there's really not 
any other great conservation feature to that land. If, let's say, uh, the climate changes sufficiently over time or soil conditions change, some fundamental underlying system that causes those species to disappear forever from that land, the landowner theoretically may be able to go to the court and say, Your Honor, uh, this, this animal or plant species is gone. It has been gone for X years. There's no evidence to suggest it's going to come back, given the trend line of uh, circumstances. And it's possible then that the court might grant an extinguishment of the easement for that purpose. We've not seen an example of that in New Hampshire, usually because <clears throat> most Virtually all conservation easements have multiple purposes. There's usually more than just the special plant species, the small horled pagonia, uh, or something else that's found on that land that gives it um, usefulness as a conservation resource. And so the array of conservation benefits that exist there are highly unlikely to be all removed because of one change circumstance or another. Um, so again, a theoretical possibility, but it's, it is uh, a, a possibility. Um, the the um, Getting to your question, Steve, about the revision, that old yep. easement that said no commercial activities except forestry and agriculture, and the landowner now comes to us and says, I really want to be able to rent my place out for weddings, or as we just um, had with a major property in Franconia, uh, the landowner wanted to build a commercial cross-country ski facility through the woodland portion of a big farm property. The easement did not allow it. We all agreed that that it was clear, but we, after careful look-see at the proposal, said to ourselves, concluded to ourselves and to the landowner, that we think a cross-country ski facility could well be appropriate on this land. And, and in fact, would it, there'd be a lot of great things about it that would enhance uh, the outdoor recreational purpose of the easement and so on and so forth. And so. What we did was to amend the conservation easement. And the concept of amendment of a conservation easement um, goes like this. You can amend either to correct or clarify some term if there was a mistake made or uh, something that just simply needs to be fixed that was unintentional. Or if you want to tighten the restrictions um, in one instance in exchange for a loosening of restrictions in some other sense, then that's possible too as long as the net result is a conservation plus for the property and as long as the financial value of those two adjustments one diminishing the value of the easement, one enhancing the value, as long as the net financial value also comes out either neutral or in favor of the easement holder. So in this case, coming back to the real example in Franconia, um, we agreed to allow for the commercial cross-country ski facility, and what he gave up to allow for that more liberal provision, the loosening of the commercial prohibition, what he gave up to get that was a relinquishment of some reserved rights that were also in the easement to subdivide the property into a number of separate holdings. Because all things being the same, it's a conservation plus to keep larger properties intact. And we went through a really careful analysis both from a conservation standpoint, but also a financial appraisal standpoint, and satisfied ourselves that the net result of that amendment would be a positive gain of both financial value and conservation value, if you will, 
to us as the holder of the easement. And we got, had to get both, uh, had to get the Charitable Trust Division of the Attorney General's Office also to approve of that change, of that amendment. So it's a complicated process. It's not, it's intentionally not simple or easy or frequent that we do that. <coughs> but there is a way of addressing certain kinds of issues that might come up. That was a really long-winded way of responding, but it's, it's reflective of the fact that we did, you know, these things should not be easy to change because they are perpetual. So. Um, Steve, I have to leave soon, so I, I just wanted to, um, I just want to talk about a few things before I, I do leave. Okay. And uh, Tom, I, I came from Stratford County, and part of my job was to be the, the, the guru of the 212 con acres of the conservation easement. Great. Um, and uh, we had three, out of all the parcels we had, we had three different types. We had the non-easement, the easement, and the special exemption. Um, and as we progressed from 2002 to 2005, when we were building out mm -hmm. the jail, the, the uh, elderly housing, the, um, the, uh, the uh, proposed uh, humane society, mm -hmm. um, you know, we found ourselves locking ourselves out of not looking ahead and thinking about, you know, okay, as we grow, what acres do we need? Um, so I just want to say that if we're looking at a conservation easement moving forward, we need to think about how we're going to grow in the next 10 years, if we're going to grow. Um, because uh, sometimes you grow faster than you think. And if you lock yourself out of uh, some of the acreage that, that we have. Um, you know, out of the 212, we had uh, 319 acres. Uh, 212 is in conservation easement. Um, you know, we have a big jail. They have, they have a big jail, they have a big nursing home. They've added on uh, a 28 apartment elderly housing. They're looking at adding that, another building. Um, they're looking at building a uh, humane society and <coughs> we were looking at uh, doing um, a uh, eminent domain but it's not a public you know a, a, a humane society is not a public yeah. activity um, so we need to be cautious if this is something we're looking at that's my only concern the other the other pieces down by the river Absolutely, you know, the forestry piece, the, the agricultural piece, um, but just keeping enough for ourselves yeah. so we don't... I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Ken, but how I'm getting some of this, there needs to be a lot of longer term planning on the oh, yeah. part as well. Absolutely. Yeah. If, if I might respond, sure. just, you know, your point is absolutely appropriate. It's, you know, we need to sweat it up front and ask the what ifs as best we can, all being imperfect humans mm -hmm. and not being able to you know, see down into the future only so far. It's really important for everybody that there be enough land left out of the arrangement completely to give you what you believe to be sufficient elbow room for doing things that you can't even imagine. I mean, who knows what the world's gonna be like in 100 years. Having said that, um, there, there. I mean, it's a it's a negotiation, if you will, with the conservation group because, as you would expect, our interest is trying to protect as much of the land as possible. At a certain point, um, we start to lose interest in a project if too much of the natural resource feature isn't protected under the terms of the easement. And the other reality, the hard reality that we have to face is that if we're talking about the purchase of a conservation easement on property, which I presume is likely to be a requirement here in this instance, just given your fiduciary responsibility, 
Um, I make that assumption up front. Delighted if you decide you didn't need any money for a conservation easement. But assuming you did, um, we have to raise the money from someplace. And our ability, at our, this is not just the Forest Society, this is any land trust group, our ability to raise significant buckaroos turns in large measure on being able to demonstrate that there are really important conservation features being protected by the terms of the easement. So there has to be sort of a really careful exploration and a pushing and pulling in a, in a good way to arrive at something that's comfortable enough um, at the time the easement mm -hmm. is set up. And you know, time, only time tells right. if that was enough or too little or too much, um, but the exercise is really important and that's part of what you should expect to sweat with whatever group you might want to explore this arrangement um, into the future. And um, you know, just, to, just to comment on, on the societies, um, it, we had put a pile of loam like three feet on the, off the, on the easement and um, one of your people caught it. I mean, three feet, I was like, you know, does it really matter? But, you know, um, you, you are very tough as far as, as, far as what is, is to be on that easement and what's not to be on the easement. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we really need to think moving forward. Can I appreciate your comments mm -hmm. very much? Thank you. Well, I just come to what he's doing here. That's great. Uh, thank you for coming. I appreciate your comments well. and your input. Go Tom. <laughs> great. Um, so we talked about um, amendments, the way amendments can potentially be um, uh, accommodated. Another sort of key idea I hope you'll be left with is, and we, we've already talked about this to a degree, is that conservation easements can be donated outright or they can be sold. And, um, you know, as I just mentioned to Ken, I assume in this case, you know, you would ex I would expect you to feel a fiduciary obligation in the assets you hold as the county to uh, need to realize some kind of compensation for a permanent restriction on your rights to do things with your own land. And I, so I enter this, and I suspect any other conservation group would enter it with the expectation that you would be needing some funding um, to, to convey a conservation easement. Um, for reasons also that I've mentioned, we would, we would expect and look to enter into a possible purchase of a conservation easement at some kind of a discounted price. In other words, not necessarily the full appraised value of a conservation easement. Frankly, because I doubt we or any other group could afford it. You've got obviously incredibly valuable property worth a whole lot of money and probably worth a whole lot more money than could feasibly be raised by any conservation group. So as with the business of the configuration of the easement, it's also important and necessary to find a balance point on a purchase price. <clears throat> it needs to be enough money to be a, a doable project for the landowner. It needs to be little enough money from the conservation group standpoint to be feasible so that we think we can raise the funds to make the project work. And that'll be some kind of a balance point um, that is highly likely to be less than the full value of the easement prop of the easement itself. Um, it's also important in our fundraising to demonstrate that the landowner has skin in the game, if you will, by making some partial <coughs> donation of that easement value in the setting up. That's a really compelling point for funders to make a project successful in a fundraising campaign. And so you might ask, okay, how does, a va how does the value of an easement get established? And there's basically a standard methodology to that called the before and after method that an independent appraiser must follow to arrive at the value. 
And so the way that works is the, it's basically two different appraisals, parallel appraisers, the appraisals. The appraiser first looks at what is the value of this, and let's say for the sake of argument for your property, it's 500 acres. I have no idea if that's appropriate or not, but for easy concept. The landowner, um, the appraiser first would look into what is the total 894 acres with all the buildings worth today, given whatever development potentials exist under local ordinances and state requirements and the capacity of the land itself. And let's say it's 100 units, whatever we want to call the financial units. It doesn't matter. It's worth 100 today, as is in the before value, before the easement. Then the appraiser looks at okay, what would that 894 acres be worth, buildings and so on, if a conservation easement is put on 500 of those 894 acres? And that number is going to be the so-called after value, after the imposition of the easement. It's clearly going to be a bunch less than the before value, but how much less depends on a whole lot of factors, including the developability of that land, what the local ordinances allow for, uh, or what development is possible under state rules, um, and so on. Not surprisingly, then, it's the difference between the before and after values that then becomes the value of the conservation easement. And there's no single sort of rule of thumb or quick and dirty way to get at that because it's so specific to the circumstances at hand. But there's a prescribed methodology that a qualified appraiser has to use in arriving at that so-called appraised fair market value of the easement. And certainly um, that becomes an important part of the negotiation and the conversation about a purchase price. Because sh without that, you know, who know, we really don't know what we're talking about here for value. So that becomes an, a really key tool for all parties to understand what's what before a potential agreement might be reached on, on price. Um, one of the real benefits, if there is a sale of a conservation easement, is that um, in effect, relative to what you're doing now with your land, it can, in effect, become found, in quotes, found money, because it doesn't, the easement doesn't force you to do anything differently from uh, what you're doing now with the land, with the conservation easement land. So it's an, it could be a potential infusion of significant cash that becomes available for whatever you choose to put it to. It might become available for reinvestment in the land itself or seed money for making other innovative or entrepreneurial things to happen on the land that are part of your broader vision for the future of the property. Um, but that's your call. That's, you, you are the landowner. You decide how you apply proceeds. But it creates <coughs> potentials and opportunities which otherwise are not there uh, with just a continuum a, a status quo of using your land without a conservation easement. So that's an opportunity that um, can be generated with a sale of, of a conservation easement on property. Can I just jump in here again? Yeah. Um, I, I want to be sure that I understand this. So in other words, then, uh, we are looking at doing a feasibility study of certain aspects of it. And, and if we went ahead and put a conservation easement on it, but those uses that we're looking at as a result of the feasibility study would be permitted uses in the conservation easement, we would now, the transfer might have the funds generated from that, putting on the conservation easement to make those kind of investments on the property. Am I understanding this correctly? Sure. No. no. Go in the general fund. Okay. It, it's, not, it's not up to the easement holder about what you do with sale proceeds that you receive. Uh, the easement is, is blind to that. Um, we can hope and encourage that there might be some 
enhancement of management of the land and things that benefit the easement property. But that's not for us to dictate or call. That's, that is your decision as the landowner, the seller of the conservation easement, you decide what to do with the money you receive. But if the decision was made to put some of those funds back into the property, it would have the a primitive use, a use that was allowed by the conservation easement. Yeah, right, yeah. right, right, exactly, exactly. Um, so one of the things that um, I think flows from this, assuming that we're talking about you know, a significant sum of money that would have to be raised, um, that's going to limit probably the conservation groups who are out there who are both ready and willing to undertake that kind of a project. Um, you're not, let me, let me be a little more crass, you're not going to be finding a long line of conservation groups lining up to be bidding on acquiring a conservation easement buying a conservation easement on this property uh, if you're looking for a serious hunk of money for that easement. Um, and I should also add that um, it's not just the purchase cost of the easement that the land trust group has to fundraise for, we also have to fundraise to cover all of our transaction related expenses and to put in sufficient funding for long-term stewardship, that monitoring and enforcement. So uh, we have always a larger total project cost and campaign goal when we embark on a big project than the part of it, albeit a significant part, that you might realize in the cash proceeds portion of the project. Um, so it's a big undertaking. And what you would want to do, I would think, in, in um, assessing w what potential groups might be a good fit for your interests and possibilities, I would suggest you want to find uh, some demonstrated capacity to raise serious money as part of your screening, if you will, for uh, finding a good conservation partner. Mm -hmm. um, Where is the list of these good conservation partners? <laughs> um, you can find, I mean, I can tell you offhand that I think it, from my experience, knowing at least a little bit I do about your property, um, that I think the, there are likely to be two groups that on the face of it may present the best opportunities for you, the Forest Society being one, the Lakes Region Conservation Trust being another, um, because we both embarked on projects like this in the past in different times and places in this area. There are other groups that might be willing to step up to the plate, um, and uh, but I'm giving you my candid take that I think based on my experience of seeing who's done what and who's in a position to take on a significant project that I suspect this would be, I think those are the two groups that present um, at least two reasonable possibilities. Having said that, uh, any group that you decide to work with or explore has to do, it has to do its own independent evaluation of possibilities. And so my, by my being here and saying that the Forest Society may be a possibility, I am in no way, shape, or form saying the Forest Society is prepared <coughs> to undertake this project with you. Uh, there's a whole lot of <coughs> more conversation that would need to be had to tighten up some really critical details uh, before we could assess that. And before you, I would suggest, would want to commit to one or the other groups in um, in embarking on a project of this scope. Um, but again, there are other groups that are out there. Um, you, can, you can find a pretty good list of all the groups with contact information if you go to the website, and this is at the end of my handout, the New Hampshire Land Trust Coalition has a little uh, find a local land trust near you kind of a button. Um, that can be a good resource. 
Um, but other groups that are there that may be of value to you to talk with, the New England Forestry Foundation is an example. Um, the Dan Hole Pond Watershed Trust, the Green Mountain Conservation Group. These are groups that do hold interests in land in this area. How ready, willing, and able they would be to embark on something like this, um, I don't want to be uh, overly judgmental, but. Is, is this something, and again, I don't want to assume anything, I want to be sure they understand, but is this something that, that a, an organization that was interested in, in holding that conservation easement may say, look, this is a bigger project, it's gonna take us a while to raise these funds, so we'll set a time limit here, we'll come back and talk to you in a year or two years when we feel we've raised the sufficient funds to do this? Typically what would happen is, um, an organ, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of winnowing down and a, and a process of building confidence and getting to know one another and working out more of the details about what actually a conservation easement would look like on the property. In other words, what kinds of terms and uses are anticipated and what might actually the configuration of that easement be. In other words, what, what area of land would it fall on with amongst your total 894 acres. And part of that process involves learning a lot more about what are the actual conservation resources on your property. Because that really should drive, I would suggest, a lot of the conversation that would follow. Because ultimately the objective here is to, cons is to protect critical and significant conservation resources with important public benefits. And so you got to know what those things are up front before you can start potentially compromising on, well, you know, we don't need the easement on necessarily all of this area, but this other area is of such unique importance and significance that that's really critical to remain in the easement. So you've you got to have the base of understanding about the natural resources first but on both sides of the equation before you can start getting to the nitty gritty of, so how's this easement actually gonna work? What, what the terms might be? Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, each group may well have different terms and priorities. So what we might be willing to compromise on or say is okay or not okay may differ with another group that you might talk to. So it's a process that mm -hmm. will take time. Ultimately, um, what would, <coughs> What would happen is a, con a purchase and sales agreement would be signed between the parties that kind of locks in an expectation about a process that then unfolds from there. But by the point at which a contract is signed, typically you would have expected most of the key provisions of an easement to have been worked out in some fashion because what you don't want to do is sign a contract and then have some later gross misunderstanding about something that's really of importance in terms of the easement restrictions that blows the whole project up late in the game. That's the last thing anybody wants. So there's actually a lot of working out of easement terms and potential layout that would happen up front. And then if things are looking good, you know, everybody seems to be on the same page. We've got at least a draft easement that's um, capturing the essence of what everybody's agreeing to that can become a part of the contract as an attachment. Then you can enter into a purchase and sales agreement with a prescribed period of time in which the buyer of the easement can uh, have to raise funds and typically for a big project that might be you know a couple of years or three years or whatever um, for raising some serious buckaroos to enable this project to be able to close at the far end of that period so that's kind of the way in which the sequence of things would unfold would, would, would this be a big project the acreage that we're talking about and at this point in time I don't know how much acreage we'd be putting on the table to put into conservation easement. But is this a good size project, medium size, small, or what? Oh, I would say for the context for the Lakes region, it's, yeah. you know, 
depending on how much of the property, certainly you're holding is a relatively large sized holding for what's left in the lakes region. There's no question about that. You know, you have an extraordinary conservation property. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind about that. Um, if you were to say, however, that the conservation easement you're imagining is only uh, something you'd be prepared to put on 200 of the nearly 900 acres. 600 and um, <laughs> then that's not a significant <laughs> conservation easement uh, from our, I shouldn't say not significant, I would say that's not an unusual conservation easement from our standpoint. Would we still do that conservation easement? Um, it all depends. It's, it's a lot of it has to do with what's the character of that 200 acres and what are the conservation resources there what are we trying to protect on this property that matters to us as an easement holder and that you want to see protected as the landowner? So again, it's all part of the, the, uh, the process of becoming better informed, more educated, more aware of your interests, the conservation, the easement holder's interests, and what can be worked out as an acceptable balance point to uh, reflect the conservation easement. Well, as you said a while back, and I think you're right on target, but, uh, we don't know what those needs may be 50, 60, 70 years down the road, so that the easement is permanent. <laughs> and, and so it's some, it may be difficult to say, okay, what, what will we be needing six or seven decades from now? That, right. So you really got to give that a lot of thought as well. Absolutely. I mean, part of our job, if we're doing our jobs well, we're trying to ask you as many of the what-ifs that we can yeah. think of. You know, have you thought about this, that, or the other thing yep. that you might want to do? Uh, and certainly Stratford County's case in point is a great one for looking at their experience. And, you know, I would want to say to you all, well, might you want to accommodate some nonprofit groups like the Humane Society and the hospice and the other things that are down there now that they have built since uh, the easement was created? You know, to get your juices flowing about potential uses and where those uses might make sense to go, just from a practical standpoint. So it, it's, it, it gets to be a, a, a process that we mm -hmm. work through together to, we hope, arrive at something that makes good sense for everybody. A um, couple of other things, because yep. I know we've, we've um, taken a bunch of time here. It's possible to have in a conservation easement what is called a backup holder of the easement, a backup interest. In legal parlance, it's called an executory interest. And basically, what that is is a totally separate conservation group. Again, it can be a governmental agency or a private land trust group to serve as the overseer of what the primary easement holder is doing and making sure that that primary group is doing its job of monitoring and enforcing well and adequately. And <coughs> the backup group um, is, it doesn't have to be in place and it adds you know, more process and complexity because now you've got another player at the table who ultimately has to agree to all the terms of the easement. Um, the most common instance that we do see is, for example, some of the public funders like LCHIP, most commonly. LCHIP requires that it be named as an executory interest holder in any conservation easement that it helps fund. And certainly, we would look at this property and a, and a purchase of easement on this land as a probably a really good candidate for LCHIP funding. So you would see layered in an additional group looking over whoever the primary holder is to make sure that the primary group is upholding its responsibilities properly. Um, public access is another common set of questions. And basically, <clears throat> in this case, um, Although public access, guaranteed public access to the property is not typically required to be a part of the conservation easement, 
my hunch would be in an easement on county lands, um, A, it would make sense for there to be an assurance of public access because frankly it's a, it's a publicly owned property to begin with, but also because many public funders, and again LCHIP included, requires there to be some guaranteed level of public access if they're going to be a funder of that project. Their, their, their requirements, and typically the provisions that you will tend to see is a limitation that that access be pedestrian only. In other words, the landowner has the full right to control any access or use above and beyond what people are doing on their two feet or their snowshoes or their cross-country skis. Um, so if you don't want ATVs, if you don't want snowmobiles, if you don't want horses on your property, you have the full discretion as the landowner to post the property against those kinds of uses. Um, or you can allow them as you wish, but that's your prerogative. What you can't do is post the property against people walking onto the land under the legitimate right that is created um, in the conservation easement language where you would find a provision about this. There are exceptions to the public access guarantee that allow you the ability to post the property during fo active forestry operations. You can post the property if you've got somebody uh, growing corn in a cornfield and the last thing you want is people trooping through it, mashing all the seedlings and you know there's some standard sorts of exceptions that are just commonsensical. Um, but otherwise you would expect I think in an easement on part of your land here to have a base level of uh, right of the public for pedestrian uses. Um, we have talked about uh, the fact that to varying degrees easements have flexibility to them in terms of some of these provisions and how the easement gets laid out on the ground. Uh, again, critical as Ken suggested to ask as many of those hard questions and peering into the future as possible in looking at a configuration and finding that, that right balance point. What is ultimately agreed upon gets surveyed on a set of reported plans that really consummate what that agreement is on where the easement does fall on the ground. It's important for everybody to have very clear uh, understanding of that and to have it be marked as such on the ground because the last thing you want is people doing things inadvertently over the line as he mentioned the dirt pile. The granted a dirt pile three feet over the line that's not a huge issue from our standpoint. It's not of great significance but we have an obligation to be monitoring and enforcing that easement and if stuff got piled inappropriately on the land, we have an obligation to try to do something about it, and that's in fact what unfolded in the situation that he described. Um, you can easily imagine the slippery slope problem. You know, if we left the pile that was three feet over, well, what about six feet? Well, what about 16 feet? And so on. And so uh, it's important that we have a relationship of understanding and trust and confidence that they know what to expect from us and we know what to expect from the landowner. And that, that's the key part of that relationship going forward. Um, so I've really talked enough, I think, about the details of this easement, um, just to kind of summarize why it might be appealing to you all. Um, it's a way of protecting significant conservation resources it may have the ability, may present the ability for you to attract some other entrepreneurial kinds of uses and players to the land who are willing to make investments in whatever the activity is they're proposing to do, but only if they see some degree of certainty looking into the future about the land continuing to be available for their use and activity. 
And that's how an easement can open up some potentials that otherwise might not be there. Players might not be willing to come in and invest serious money of their own in some entrepreneurial activity if they are thinking, well, gosh, you know, three years from now, the county might decide to sell off this land. Well, I'm not so eager and in such a hurry to put serious buckaroos of my own in this entrepreneurial idea unless I see that long-term commitment and availability of land for what it is I want to do. So that's where I think some really interesting possibilities might get opened up um, with creating that stability of use and availability going into the future. Uh, are you aware of <coughs> examples with that possibility has opened up? And if so, could perhaps you email some of that stuff to me? Well, I think I, that could that could possibly be you know a selling point in this because. As you say, it, it, it opens up, it gives a certainty to something that, that's uncertain at this point. The in time. most common example of that are farmers. You know, you have a, a property that you want to lease. Mm -hmm. The farmers are interested in long term leases because mm -hmm. if they're going to really um, pour resources into the land to make it more productive, to do what they are proposing to do. And you know they're bringing inputs in terms of fertilizer and really enhancing the improvement of that soil, which takes a long time, perhaps, and may take serious inputs of dollars and effort and work. They're not going to be willing to do that if they think that what they might be pouring in is going to be for naught in three years um, once they're because you're only willing to sign a three or five year lease or term with them and you may decide to um, sell the land for development in year six. That may be a real, mm -hmm. a real limitation on some of the possible uses that perhaps you might uh, have as part of your vision and plan for the future use of the land. Does your, do they allow biosolids? Um, we, th they are permitted under best practices as long as they're applied in accordance with uh, recommended uh, practices and approaches. That is not an inherent uh, prohibition from the standpoint of our easement. But that's a good example where our easements don't in intentionally don't get prescriptive about that. It said human waste. What do, you, what do you mean? Your restriction in here was um, you can't put stuff on the man-made trash. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, no disposal I'm, of man-made uh, or hazardous material. Very good pickup on the, on the verbiage. <laughs> um, I was generalizing to convey the concept here, but the intention is not to be prohibiting the application of biosolids, if that's part of a coherent uh, approach to agricultural use of the property, and if the application of those materials are done in accordance with best practices. But very good eye on the potential on the face of an inconsistency there. So thank you for picking up on that. Can I run through a few? Sure. Go ahead. Tom, uh, thank you for your time. I know I've been with you in other presentations. Um, tell me about your organization. Are you a profit or a nonprofit? We're a nonprofit, tax exempt organization. The uh, what is the monies that you are that you do generate to sustain yourself? Mm -hmm. Is is that in large part by brokering land sales to someone to another party or? Um, or monies made from the forest resources? Um, we derive our income from a large array of different sources. Um, probably the largest source are essentially individual contributions from households and members. Um, sometimes those folks make their contributions through their businesses or through private foundation types of arrangements, but that's first and foremost, the largest source. 
We, um, we do make money on um, forest products that we manage from the 54,000 acres that we own, some of which we manage. Um, we do generate some income from rental of some of our office space at our conservation center in Concord. Um, we also make some money by the concession that we um, lease out for management and use of Lost River. We actually own Lost River in North Woodstock, but the White Mountain Attractions is the business enterprise uh, that pays us for the privilege of running the facility and making whatever money that's, they can. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's uh, right. Just, I'm trying to give you a sense. Yeah. And, and we do make some money on our endowment and investments, and occasionally we are in a position to actually uh, be given land that isn't necessarily land that we want to hold as a so-called reservation, where we might sell that property and use the proceeds to do other land conservation work. Occasionally, we get given property that has no conservation value. Uh, a 10 acre building lot in Mason that we sold a couple of years ago. Um, and we simply have used those funds to do our work. In other cases, someone might give us property, maybe even with a house, wonderfully, if that happens. And if it has some conservation value to it, but it's not a property we want to keep as a reservation, we might sell that 30 acres. Uh, with the house, but with a conservation easement that we create and retain on the 25 acres, because that does have some modest conservation value. The sale proceeds from something like that, uh, which we love to get when it happens, is obviously a big help, but that's an irregular occasional thing. That's, that's fine. You, yep. You're satisfied with your answer. <laughs> Good. I've, I've got several questions and we're out of time. Yeah. So Good. I'm going Go to I'm I'm trim you. So um, foresters have to be involved. Do you have in your employ through the society who those foresters will be? Our local foresters have the opportunity to participate in this? Uh, the latter. Uh, uh, I should say both. We have foresters on staff but in terms of the foresters who are required to prepare a management plan for the landowner and to supervise operations on your property, that's your choice as to whom you select as a licensed forester to do that work, not our, not our dictate. Um, we, you had touched on uh, a typical easement uh, pathways uh, and so forth, and typically done on foot. Uh, if I meant, I'm going to give you a list of things. Tell me just yes or no. Sure. Um, Boy Scouts, rustic overnight camping. Uh, that may well be allowed. We do it, it's done on the Stratford County property, for example. Hunting? Uh, perfectly fine. Uh, we expect that to happen, but we often will leave that up to the discretion of the landowner as opposed to mandating that it has to be a, pr a prescribed use. Uh, Non-motorized and motorized. Um, it could be fat tire bikes in certain areas. It could be snowmobiles. Is it less typical than accepted? Uh, we don't, we don't care, we don't, the easement does not address the question of motorized versus non-motorized activities. Um, so that if you choose to allow or conduct yourself motorized activities on the land, that's your prerogative. Where we're going to get interested is in looking at the impacts of those activities on the ground. If, you're, if that activity, whether it's caused by you yourselves or the public you are permitting to do those things on your land, if that activity is starting to create serious ruts, erosion, or other what we think could be negative and significant impacts, that's when other provisions of the easement may take hold and cause us to raise questions about what's going on. But if it was important and it was known in the beginning in the process that that was part of it and that was kept in check, then that is something that could be considered. Yeah, sure. Uh, put it another way, we don't we don't want a provision in there, we don't like easements that say no motorized uses because we can't enforce that, even if the landowner wants that restriction. That's a 24-7 enforcement job that we cannot fulfill. 
And, and if we can't fulfill it, we don't want it in the easement. So that's your prerogative. I looked, I looked on the map here as we were speaking where projects are close yep. by. There's probably nothing that comes real close to connectivity from what I saw from our entire parcel to anything connected to your As I recall, nothing immediately adjacent. Um, there are some other conservation projects in the area, but nothing. We, we, what about we, the Wolfboro Conservation well, Group? We, Don't they just own a piece just over the line? Well, we have mapping of that. We, we have yeah, there, there are the lots of pieces in Wolfboro, uh, right on the town line. Uh, those may be some of the closest. Uh, the Dan Hole Pond uh, projects uh, that they've done are probably to the northwest, the closest in that direction. Um, and there's some other things that are being talked about and potentially worked on that would be closer, but nothing immediately adjacent that's in place that I recall. You talked about reserved rights of landowners, mm -hmm. and you touched on commercial activities. Uh, you talked about agritourism. Right. Uh, you said that po the possibility of reserving area for solar, uh, renewable resources. What else falls in that large bucket of renewable resources? Um, the language that's there has an explicit bias in favor of solar uh, array because all other things being the same at present, um, we see generally less impacts associated with solar installations as opposed to other types of um, renewable energy possibilities. Having said that, if <coughs> I'm sorry, one other statement and then a, and then, um, a qualifier. Um, in the language that we start with, we have a prohibition against renewable energy structures being taller than 30 feet, which on the face of it would preclude, at least in today's technology, most any wind turbine. But if you were to say to us, uh, look, we've got some potentially great <coughs> wind turbine sites that we want to include within the conservation easement area, then what we might want to do is talk about having a separate reserve right that would really focus on wind power generation that uh, hopefully can reach a, a, a common point of agreement that allows you enough flexibility to do what you think you might want to do but again, which on, from our standpoint is still being reasonably protective of whatever the conservation resources are that might be in those sites that you have in mind. Um, so when we talk of respectable money offers, mm -hmm. the, and uh, the potential of what a property is and then you back out, uh, what you're taking out, and the difference between that and coming up with the value, for the, for the most part, almost everything is going to be back land for us. Most everything we have is probably not connected greatly to road surfaces yeah. or anything else. Yeah. So it would seem to me in my mind, you're probably never going to get above and beyond what land value would be out there. You're not going to pay more than raw land, back land pricing. So it would, it would seem to me, just on the surface, that you're not, you're not typically going to be in a price range uh, more than just a, f a few, if that, many thousand dollars per acre. So a 500, 500 acre parcel isn't going to drive, I don't want people thinking this is going to be millions of dollars. It's probably going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars typically. Am I fair to say that? Uh, I would agree to the concept whether 3,000 an acre is a reasonable, I, I really wouldn't know. I'm, just, I'm, I'm just throwing out there, but it's, <clears throat> yeah, it's not millions of dollars that we're talking about. If, if you were to leave out of the easement most of the core area that has the road frontage, then I think the concept of what you're describing is Probably makes so. sense. That on, In relative terms, we're talking about pretty unvaluable land and pretty unvaluable conservation easement, invaluable, um, because of the limited developability and, and capacity of those outlying areas. Right. We're talking conceptually. Yeah. But you know what, what would inform that conversation, as I mentioned, is 
coming up with a scenario or two that we would then put in, we with you would put in front of an appraiser to say, okay, start tying some numbers here to some scenarios or configurations. And then we have a, a much better understanding of what we're actually talking about. But you're, I'm, I'm, I think your I'm, concept. I'm very appreciative of your conversation. Yeah. Don't take away that. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm trying to get it global where we're at. Sure. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Probably for Mark, I guess. Um, the um, zoning in Ossipee, is the minimum 200 feet on the frontage? Typically it is. Yeah. Typically. There's, there, there are instances, uh, village districts and other places where you can get down to 100 feet, okay. quarter acre spots, but out here it'd be much, it'd be larger parcels. 200 feet. 200 feet. Most likely. Because we do have a bit of road frontage that's not. Isn't there frontage in Route 28? Yes, there is. Okay. Both sides. What about 171? 171 is yes. Okay. Would a 20 acre um, solar field be acceptable? It's hard to answer that in, in um, it might be. Um, but as I hope you're getting a sense, um, our, the easement holder's ability to respond to any given proposal is going to be very specific to that proposal. Where is it? What are the conservation resources that exist now that might be negatively impacted by that installation? Things like, for example, um, is that going to be positioned on what are existing prime agricultural soils and productive ag land? at present. Um, and if that were the case, then we might come back to you and say, all right, um, are there some other locations where maybe you're not parking this on prime ag soil? Or maybe that are less visible um, to the traveling public if we're saying that the scenic value of the property as seen from the road is a really important purpose of this easement and this array is kind of smack in the face of people driving by, are there some other locations where you could still find it acceptable and workable and feasible that may be way less visible, way less impacting on what we care about? That's the kind of process and dialogue that we would have on many proposals that you might come up with. Uh, another question I have, does the land have to be contiguous? No. No. Um, it could be in different uh, units or areas that aren't necessarily connected. That would be possible. Yeah. Another question. You had talked about you, you like renewable energy, but wind power has some, some height limitations and restrictions unless there was a specific site that you went along with. But if there was a specific site for, for wind power, would, would that permission basically be spite, site specific to that to that site? Um, that's a really hard one to answer without knowing more about what okay. you, you, what I would expect if yeah. you wanted to kind of dig into that a little farther yeah I think it would make sense for you all to get some independent read from people who know a whole lot more about this than any of us do about the sites that present the best possibilities on your property. There are plenty of smart people who can look at the situation and advise you and say, uh, you know, either, boy, under today's technology, you really don't have much to work with, or if you did have something to work with, here are the two locations that look like they might be the best, such as they are. And so we want to think about provisions that might allow you to position a structure in either of the two best places, whatever that might mean. But that's the kind of process that we would want to go through and suggest you go through in structuring something like that. We, it's not in our interest to force you to nail down today an exact site for something that is so speculative still in your future. We want to give you as much reasonable flexibility as long as the windows that we s specify are such that we're not in either place 
going to be negatively impacting other things that we said we care about protecting. Okay, all that aside, what would be the next informational step that we should take? I think, um, I mean, it's, it, I don't, I don't want to be presumptuous in responding, but I think there's a lot more conversation that I think you all need to have internally, um, not only within your committee, but ultimately with the commissioners and the delegation. I mean, the buck stops with the delegation in terms of decision-making authority, as I understand it, about conveyance of an interest in this real estate. And so ultimately, um, getting people educated about the possibilities, perhaps in the same kind of way that we've spent time today, and expanding that educational effort to the other people who are stakeholders in this situation, I think is probably an important process that um, you all would want to think about and how best to do. I'm happy to sort of be a, a, a helper with you to expand the circle of understanding and awareness of possibilities um, w without prejudice that we're necessarily, you know, the best group that you'd want to be dealing with, but um, being more of a neutral presenter of an advocate for a conservation easement as a possible tool uh, is really what I'm trying to focus on and not so much that the Forest Society is necessarily the best uh, fit for you, it may not be, uh, but helping you get conceptually to the point where um, you might in fact ultimately have a vote by the delegation that endorses the concept of, in, of, of endorsing an ex, a formal exploration of conveyance or sale of a conservation easement on a significant portion of your holdings. Um, uh, not for me to imagine how that might be worded, but I think a conservation partner would want to see some formal expression on your part by the ultimate decision makers before investing further time and effort. And I recognize that may take some time on your end. Thank you. Um, um, first of all, I want to thank you very much, Tom. You, you've done good. You just gave us a lot, a lot of information good. here. But, but I'm leaving this meeting with the sense that not just this committee, but the delegation and the commissioners They've got to have a lot of those conversations that you say. There's got to be a much clearer sense of just longer range planning and, and right. how this all going to fit in together. Right, and it, you know, I know you've got other things in the planning yeah. queue that are going on in terms of the county yeah. lands, and and it may well mesh with some of those other things that you're exploring. Yeah. Um, so completely expect this not to be a quick or fast process. One of, the, one of the things that, that we, we uh, you said, and you fit the nail on the head, this committee is exploring an awful lot of options, looking in a lot of different directions. But one of the things that we are looking at, and it doesn't mean we're going to end up with it, is basically leasing out some of the land to farmers. Mm -hmm. Is there anything in that conservation easement, other than the, re the restrictions that are beyond it, but is there anything in that conservation uh, easement that would prevent the county from leasing out land? No, we specifically say that leasing of the property for permitted uses is explicitly okay. okay. It's not an inherent um, okay. prohibition. Okay. I just would hate to, this committee will probably wrap up long before there be conservation easements on the property because it has a long process, but I wouldn't want this committee to put options on that table before the, the commissioners and the delegation that a conservation easement would, would say, no, you can't do that because that would be wasted effort and time on our part. Okay. Is there anything else? Any other questions, comments? I put some resources at the end of my handout. Yes, I saw that. Uh, Thank you. Just, you know, lots more information yeah. at those websites and locations uh, where you can steer yourselves or others to, to read up more or get a sense of other groups and possibilities. So. Very helpful. Thank Good. You. Thank, thank you. you. Tom, thank you very much. Appreciate You're welcome. It. Great. It's a great learning experience for us. Much to learn. Have a safe trip home from that fog out there. Well do. Yeah. You're available if there are other questions. Uh, of course. 
Absolutely. My email's right there at the top, yeah. so um, or in my phone number, so let me know how I can be useful to you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're getting close to cleaning time here, but uh, let's approve the December 29 minutes. As revised. The latest ones. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Comments? If not, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? All right. Uh, I know you're still working on the trail network, Susan, but it's almost five. Can, can we postpone that till the next meeting over the things you definitely want to get on the table here today? No, I'm still right in the middle of putting it all together. Okay, we all right. meeting this all right. Uh, I just have one thing that I want to bring up and then we'll... Uh, I would like to sit down and talk with, uh, with Howard Chandler, who's the administrator for the nursing home. Uh, as we know, the county, the nursing home, and the jail basically have a food budget of three quarters of a million dollars. And in the past, I'm getting all this second and third hand, but in the past, the dietitian was not interested in even discussing the progress grown on, on the farm here. But I understand that the new dietitian is, is, I've been told, is very open to that. And I'm wondering, as we begin to put together a bigger picture here, of how the two may play together, uh, if there be any objection on the part of the committee, that I at least sit down and talk with them and explore that to see whether there is any interest. If we lease the, the land out to farmers, if they thought that there was an opportunity here to sell some of their produce, fill up three quarters of a million dollars at the county nursing home and, and jail by, that might be an incentive for them to say, okay, now we know we took the tour of the old, teaching the old nursing home, there, there was refrigeration in there, there's freezing in there, and so forth. So that there may be possibilities here. I don't know, but would there be any objection for me just to sit down and then talk with Howie Channel in the dietitian to explore that? I have no issue. Pardon? I have no issue. Okay. All right. I will, I'll see if we can't do that then. Is there a motion to adjourn? There is. All right. <laughs> is there a second? Second. All right. All in favor? I want to thank you very much. That was very nice for you to bring that gentleman. And it was very nice for him to be here. Yes, yes.